methane is the new CO2. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. Hey guys, welcome back to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's leading thinkers on to talk about the future. Today, we've got Yotam Ariel on the line. Thanks for coming today, Yotam. Thanks for having me, man. And before, I'm going to cut all this part out anyways. Is it Yotam? Am I saying your name right? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So Yotam, thanks for coming. I like to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. So what's your story? I'm the founder and CEO of Bluefield. Uh, we are uh, putting an optical sensor we developed on microsatellites that orbit the Earth and can detect uh, industrial gas leaks anywhere in the world, and we then sell it as a service. And before this, you were focused on solar energy? Yeah, I founded a solar energy company in China, and we were selling to Africa. I look at your background, it's very interesting, because you're founding leading technolo- technological companies, but that are focused on an impact, focused on making a change. What's the deal behind that? Because there's better ways to make a ton of money, typically. What, how did you focus on what you focus on? Yeah, I think I've always been... Uh, uh, most excited when we can change people's life, but uh, it sounds kind of big and uh, out of reach. But but every once in a while, you 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 suddenly see, for example, with solar, I started engaging in solar. I thought it would be a good thing, and then I saw it actually makes the most sense in Africa, and then got exposed to those insights that the large energy companies are trying to reduce their emissions, and you know because of the context of climate change and. Uh, and then I saw how satellite technology is becoming easier and more accessible. So you kind of connect the dots. And um, yeah, whenever, whenever there, there can be good impact and some uh, business model to support it, that's where I get most excited. And I can go on for years and persevere because you, uh, you know, you've talked with entrepreneurs. I guess listeners of the show have been entrepreneurs or, or have talked with them. You got to be pretty persistent. <laughs> And uh, things they you know for for most of the days things look like it's not going to happen. So you got to be really motivated to make it happen. Yeah, it's a roller coaster, massive highs and massive lows. We uh, we see a trend moving towards this social entrepreneur space where it seems like younger generations are more and more focused on making an impact while making money. Any thoughts on why? I think people that I've talked with and, and also encouraged are doing. I know there is this, like you said, you can make money easier from other ideas. I, I disagree. You, you talk with any entrepreneurs, they, they put all they got into the, the business. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So if you're going to put everything you got, so why, why not take something that, you know, sure you could do some computer game or, or something like that. But what if it was something that would change the world or change people that, that you care about. So I think that, yeah, realizing that you can have both. Exactly. You can have both. That's the entire point of this podcast, getting on the future people that are changing the world, focused on their hobbies and businesses and see where it's headed. And I want to jump into solar technology. Now, what's the state of the industry? That's something that's constantly changing and hard to keep up with. Oh, solar. I've been out of it for, for two years now, but, um, it's, uh, I think it's, I mean, it's picking up the, the prices when I, started uh about a decade ago the um, the costs were 2.5 dollars per watt it doesn't matter what watt is or what what this means but nowadays it's like 30 cents per watt so you can see the uh how much it decreased the cost of deploying solar and uh yeah there are like millions of people in africa that had no access to modern electricity and now they do and companies that are backed by venture capital are making this is a good investment so uh, solar is very exciting. It's uh, it's going to gain more and more uh, share in the energy mix. But um, you, you'll see on when we start talking about methane, why it's so important because um, oil and gas are still going to have the lion's share for a few decades more. Let's talk about that. What do you see as the as the future for renewables and as the future? So as you alluded to with Bluefield, essentially you're sensing methane emissions to look at the implications on a global a global basis. Is that a fair assumption? 
So the impl- it's a, it is a global basis, but the, um, the resolution, it, it will be easier to think about it this way. We're creating something like a Google map, but instead of seeing addresses, right now you can see any address in the world, right, on a Google map. Think about that, but instead of the addresses, you see any emitter in the world within a meter's type of resolution, and you see how much it is emitting in real time, and it gets updated on a daily basis. When you have that kind of resolution, then um, you're able, both the emitter, a lot of people think that the oil and gas companies are evil, and they just uh, they tell their team, you know, open it up, release greenhouse gas, and they just sit out there and laugh. Uh, but in fact, they don't. They hate releasing met, um, greenhouse gases, and they invest billions of dollars in trying to reduce it and get more efficient. So they, they're also they're looking for this uh, information, this high resolution that can tell them exactly when and where there is a leak. And then there is the governments that are looking for the same thing. There is a lot of money being funneled into reductions, but how do you know it's working? Uh, you can't. So with this kind of um, visibility on who is emitting what, where, and when, uh, we'll be able to reduce. And in fact, uh, we've done a calculation. We, just with the information that Bluefield will provide, we could be reducing three gigatons a year of CO2 equivalent, which is more than 10% of the global emissions. Why are those emissions, why are the reductions happening? Is that a result of seeing the measurements and then improving, or is that something else? Because essentially, especially with methane, as soon as you know where the leak is, you can capture it. And more than half of those leaks, when you capture them, you fix a pipeline or you install a, an equipment that doesn't allow it to escape or you install another storage next to um, where it's leaking and capture it. When you do that, more than half of those leaks are profitable because um, you can sell the, the methane. It's essentially natural gas. And when you burn it, it's considered clean. It doesn't emit much CO2, unlike coal or other um, fossil fuels. So you're losing something that makes money and putting it into the atmosphere. Talk to me about the, the climate change implications of this and the, what percentage methane makes up for greenhouse emissions. So um, uh, you can think of methane as the new CO2. CO2 has been all over the headlines for many years, but methane on a 10-year period is over 100 times more potent than CO2. So if you have one ton of methane that gets emitted, it's as if you, you emitted 100 tons of CO2. And so when you capture it, it the, the impact is much better. And uh, according to the World Bank, over 25% of global warming is because of methane emissions. How much of that is just from food production with uh, industry f- farming um, for animals, beef, etc.? So a third is from beef and, and the um, related uh, livestock. And then uh, another third is from um, uh, oil and gas. Um, and another third is a mix. You got landfills, wastewater, heavy industries. So is it fair to say you're living in the convergence of the, the climate change and then the space tech revolution? I guess a little bit of IoT as well. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah. Yes. How do, you, how do you see those progressing? So as, as we become more advanced sensing, you're focused on CubeSats, I believe? Right. So for listeners that don't know this whole concept of CubeSats or microsats or all of these words, uh, think of a satellite. I'm sure you have an image in your mind. Now think that it's the size of a backpack. And so that's that's basically it. It's a microsatellite, you know, can fit in your backpack. It's got a sensor. In our case, it's an optical sensor that can see methane. Uh, But there are other companies with sensors that can see just the visible images, but that, you know, centimeters resolution, or they, they, they have radars, all sorts of ways to, uh, to look at our world. And the CubeSat generation is primarily, it's a lean startup of cheaper, smaller, faster. Where, where do you see that going for space technology as we become more advanced? Is everything going to go CubeSat or how do you see this progressing? Yeah, so definitely the, um, everything is shrinking and now you have this access to space. And you have this, um, they call it a bus. The, the satellite is, is a platform, essentially, with power and some uh, ability to point or, or go to a specific orbit. And everything is shrinking. So you can, you know, what, what used to be a sensor and satellite the size of a school bus can now fit um, a backpack or a microwave. So that's definitely the direction we're going to. And um, I like to think of it as 
let's say 300 years ago, we went into a hospital, it would be very limited. Like the way the doctor would try to see what's happening with your body. But think about you walking into like state of the art hospital today. They can inspect you in so many ways. I mean, x-ray and, and um, uh, ultrasound and MRI and uh, all sorts of ways. They can see everything that's happening with you. And I think in, in about 10 years, that's the capacity we will see. We will be able to see our world, which is uh, extremely exciting. What are some interesting use cases that you see or foresee happening? So the, we've already seen with images, uh, there was a company that they measured the uh, oil, uh, oil storage, the, the tanks, the ceiling go up and down depending if it's full or, or empty. And so there is different shadow. And they, took, they, look at the, um, they look at these shadows through the images uh, from satellites, and they ran a, a whole AI software on that, and they calculated how much uh, oil uh, reserves are in China. And that, that number that they came up with was completely different from every projection of all of the major um, analysts in the market. So that's, that's one implication. There's also um, uh, imaging satellites that, that have helped in uh, earthquakes or when there was the flood in, um, I mean, the hurricane in Texas. Uh, so they were able to see which, which areas are offline or online in different industries. There is uh, ship tracking, uh, what is it, all kinds of deposits, uh, weather prediction. Yeah, these, these are in the Earth observation category. So basically everything, observation and then analysis. You see yeah. better and better tools becoming from having more sensing and more AI, so to speak. That's the, yes. that's the early direction you see this going? Where, what, about, what about 10, 20 years out? What are, make some bold predictions on where we're headed as a species in terms of space. Yeah, so if you think about it, so we are now doing all these sensors and, and kind of mapping out our own world in a way that we've not been able to see before. Uh, but then the next step would be to go to other planets and start sensing them. So everybody's, um, whenever we see methane on Mars or, or anywhere else, everybody gets really excited because it's, uh, it could be an indication of life. So when you detect different, I don't know, different indicators, uh, it, could, it could mean that there was something there or there is something there. You can look at just uh, minerals or, or maybe life. What do you think about the implications? So I know Peter Diamantis is focused on mining asteroids, and now we're able to own asteroids in space. Have you seen, uh, have you seen any speed up in space companies being launched or rockets being launched because of it? Uh, there is, uh, I've heard those, of this one company where they have like a, like a, they spin some kind of a wheel, and then like a catapult, they shoot, they shoot up uh, satellites. This doesn't, is not suitable for, um, if you have a sensor inside that satellite, it's not suitable because of the inertia. But um, what they want to do is, is ship like uh, construction materials uh, in a cheaper way. So you can build, I don't know, spaceships in, in orbit. So yeah, I think there is, there is an explosion of, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, propulsion companies. So th those things uh, as well, I think. The, the whole space market or the space tech has come to new life uh, just in the past few years. And speaking of the manufacturing, I'm talking to a company soon. They're essentially building 3D printers for space. The idea being, if you can get up there, then manufacturing makes things much easier. But you were talking about how space seems to be taking off, so to speak. At the same, at the same time, it's hardware, so it's hard, it's expensive. What's it been like raising money for a company that's a space tech company? And are you guys doing the launches yourselves? The well, no, everything is is a service now. The launch, like it, it's essentially like booking a, a flight from New York to San Francisco. You buy a seat. I mean, it's funny because I once talked with a lady. I said, she said, "Are you going? Are you going? Are you going to need a whole rocket to go to space?" And I said, "Well, you know, just like you came here, you didn't fly on a private jet, did you?" And she said, "No, I actually did." <laughs> so. I said, well, uh, we are not going to space on a private jet. We book a seat. So when Elon Musk uh, launches one of his big rockets, uh, it's full of satellites. All the Indians, they have a rocket as well. And it's released like uh, over 100 satellites in one go. So the launch is a service. Then you have the data download and, and also upload. That again is a service. There's a company, they have a network of, um, of ground stations. And then even the satellite, we're not designing our own satellite. 
where there are satellite companies with off-the-shelf designs. You say to them, well, I need this size for my sensor. And then they, um, they, they build one, uh, integrate your sensor into it. It gets launched, you know, uh, booked uh, with a rocket launcher. And the data is downloaded by this uh, third-party data communication company. And the next thing we know it, we have all of our data on the Amazon cloud. Uh, and then we start working with it and selling the alerts and analytics to the clients, just like a, a software company. So the complexity is starting to get commodified then? Yeah. That's very interesting. It'll be interesting to see. That's essentially Amazon's bread and butter, the api every type of business and let others ride on it. I wonder if that's Jeff's big vision of his rocket ships, is to just be able to let other people ride on the coattails. Well, they... Uh, right. These guys, you can think of them as uh, as FedEx, as shipping companies, like uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, and Jeff Bezos or, or um, uh, Richard which do you Brand. look up to more of those three? Uh, none of them. I in what in what way? Let's say you could meet one of those three. Who would you want to meet, and why? I already met two, and uh, oh, that takes this whole conversation in a totally different way. Who'd you, <laughs> who'd you meet, and how to go? I met Richard Branson and I met uh, Elon Musk at the conference. You know, I feel they're a bit out of reach. And I mean, they're doing amazing things, but it's, it's a shipping company to space and other people are working on it. But yeah, they're, they're pioneers and they're enablers, but uh, I'm not as excited as others about them. I don't know why. I think once we've glimpsed gods, we realize they're mere mortals. And that's... Yeah. Uh... That's very important, especially the concept of this show, being able to get on some of the best of the best to see that anybody can change the future if they set their mind to it. I want to transition a little bit. We were talking about living in other planets and other worlds. And I know you brought up earlier that you moved to China for 12 years, which is very much a different world. You, you learned Chinese, but tell me about why you went there and how the experience shaped you. I, was, um, I, I went there because I didn't want to stop my, my adventures. I was in the... Um, I grew up in Israel, and then at, at the age of 18, everybody got to the military. I was in the Navy, and after that, uh, I was also a sailor. So I, I traveled and walked around the world on, on boats uh, and yachts. And so for two years, I've been just traveling around the world. And m- my parents said, oh, you, you'd better get a higher education, you know, go to university. But I didn't want the excitement to, uh, to finish. So I, I, I found like uh, not a compromise, found a solution, just do the degree in China. And at that time, uh, it was 2006, people asked me, oh, what on earth are you going to do if you knew how to speak Chinese? <laughs> and uh, a few years later, China kind of became a, a dominating power. So everybody's excited when, uh, when you know how to speak Chinese. But um, I think being in China, being in another planet, and I recommend it to everybody, is... Um, is to see how, how there is other ways to think about things. Um, they think completely different, like the, the, the logic, the way they come to conclusions or actions. It's very different. It's incredibly different. I, I lived for six weeks in China, and that was being a six-foot-two tall white guy. I, I was <laughs> a very, very Chinese part of a, a Chinese suburb, so I would walk by and people would run to the window. It's, a, it's an incredible experience. What did you learn from traveling and from working with people in other cultures that has impacted you on your journey today? The, um, uh, is that you can't assume you know why that person said what, what they said and that you interpreted it correctly. So you don't know if like you hear someone say something to you. Uh, you don't know if you should be angry or thankful or, or, um, or embarrassed or, or whatever because it's um, like I remember there was in Africa actually the villagers, they wouldn't, I mean, they, they want electricity, but they would, they would not wipe the solar panels off of dust. And I think we told them a few times that they would get more electricity if they, if they clean the solar panels, but they didn't. Uh, I, I never quite understood why, but uh, yeah, but there's just, you know, they have some certain logic on that. There was another situation when someone told me to, it was a comment on some of our um, marketing materials. And, and I just, I didn't, you know, most people would have read it as he's just trying to, uh, he doesn't like us or he does, he's trying to be, I don't know, annoying or get power or something. But 
for me, I, because I was in so many cultures, I could also see how he would do it. And in his mind, he's actually trying to help us. So I think kind of the ability, once you saw people thinking about things from different ways, you're able to not get angry and then label someone uh, without fully understanding why, why they did it and, and how did they view it when they did it. I think this is really great. Yeah, the empathy and compassion of being able to see things from other people's perspective seems to be dying in our culture, unfortunately. Social media is not helping that. No. <laughs> and, uh, no. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Africa and you worked uh, b- before with Bennu Solar, the company that you founded, trying to bring solar power to the third world. Talk to me a little bit about how that went and what some of the challenges were. I think it went great. We have uh, tens of thousands of people in Africa that didn't have access to modern electricity before, and we were doing it all while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we were able to improve the labor conditions in Chinese factories, because that's, that's an issue too. I think the, the challenges, they were, <laughs> I need to pause and think about it. There's so many. Anything from dealing uh, with different regulations, or for example, in shipping documents, you could have misspelled a, uh, a word or just put the wrong number or wrong word. And that would mean that uh, maybe six months, which could bankrupt your clients. We, we didn't bankrupt any clients, but uh, I know from others, <laughs> I know from others that, uh, yeah, they had the goods uh, stuck, you know, for six months. So we, we were paying a lot of attention to that. Yeah, it's horrible. I ran an e-commerce company and Japanese customs is the worst. We had stuff stuck there for months and eventually just gave up on it. It's, a, it's an incredible challenge doing business globally, although it seems like it should be so much easier. I know with what you're doing now, are you working with clients internationally? How does your business focus look today? Yeah, we work with international clients. They, uh, they, so the, the, the good part about this is that we're selling data or, or alerts and anal- analytics. And so uh, if you think of a, a company the size of BP, they would have operations anywhere from Iraq to Nigeria to uh, Middle East and uh, you know, Asia and, and, and North America. And for them, they want to see everything on that infrastructure. But this part, like the service that we offer, because it's captured from satellites, when they access the data platform, they see it all. So that's, I think that's kind of a, not a hack, but yeah, we've seen other satellite companies and they work internationally. They, they expand quite uh, fast because you don't need to install anything other than, uh, you know, consuming data. What do the costs look like? If I want to work with a satellite company, I want to start a satellite startup today. I want to have some space on a, a CubeSat or one of the larger satellites. What does that look like from a cost perspective? Sure. It, it all depends on the sensor size. So there is this company called Planet. And they used to be called Planet Labs. And their, their satellites are the size of a, of a shoebox, very small. And so, uh, but then they, they need to have hundreds in orbit. So they are still. I mean, they've received funding of like $200 million. So it's still, there's some capital involved in it. But uh, let's think, if you wanted to start a space company, I think first thing you'll do would be to do a, uh, a prototype on Earth, fly it on an aircraft like a Cessna, and then take it to the International Space Station and have it installed for three months over there. There is a service like that. And then raise more money. So, so the aircraft part will be probably, with your team and everything, will be probably in the half a million dollar. And then the International Space Station stage would be something in the range of uh, $2 million. And then you would uh, go to satellites and you'd probably need 5 to $10 million for the first satellite or two. And then it's up to you. You can, you can deploy many more and uh, you, you've basically proven the economics. So even if you needed the $100 million, that's, that would be available for you. What if I wanted to build a company that's more akin to what you guys are doing now with Bluefield? So I want to build a sensor company where I'm putting my sensors on someone else's satellite. You can track your ex-girlfriend around the world and follow her ex <laughs> or whatever, whatever the company is that we're doing. What, what does that look like and how do I start that process? So that one still, you, you'd want to prove the sensor on, a, on, a, on an aircraft. Uh, but then there are those companies, for example, there is one company called Loft Orbital. So they, they are like Airbnb in space. 
or a condo in space. So they will take your sensor and you can kind of rent space on their satellites and they'll, they'll put it in orbit on a satellite, operate it for you, and then just see the, um, the, you just get the data. So depending on the complexity, you could be paying rent between half a million to a million dollars per satellite per year. Okay, that's not terrible. You can definitely get that funded. It's much easier than hardware. It's not terrible given that you get the whole world. You can you observe the whole world in that, uh, you know, for that amount. Speaking of getting the whole world, where do you see us going towards space tourism? Any ideas on a time frame? Space tourism? Yeah, I'll be the first to sign up. I'd love to go to space for a weekend. I guess uh, five years, five to ten, you know, it's because life, uh, people can lose their life if, if there is a, you know, you can't MVP it, you can't minimum viable product that. Could you though, if someone decided to sign a waiver? Oh yeah, some people might be, feel that strong that um, they would be like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I, I guess I don't know enough about the space tourism. I, I know that I think with Virgin Galactic from Richard Branson, I think they had an accident and it kind of, and people, someone died and they, um, that, that kind of changed the whole plans for that. Yeah. It's the same thing with self-driving and people being worried about your car crashing into a parked, yeah. uh, a parked bus. Etc. But it's going to come. I mean, we've done it with aviation and, and cars. Oh, so, it's, it, it'll definitely come. You just have to get over that public perception. Speaking of which, with, with the whole climate change issue and being a myth and convincing people about the need to try to fight climate change, what are you seeing that's working and what are you seeing that's just falling flat? Any thoughts? I, th- I think the problem with climate change is that it's, uh, I mean, we, with perception by the public is that the, the information is coming from scientists. So scientists they will tell you, oh, we're not certain it's because of, you know, um, um, People. it's man-made. But, but you, in the language of scientists, they're not certain of anything. They, they have some uncertainty about gravity. So, so you have, so you, you know, the, the thing is when you talk with scientists, you say, well, how uncertain are you? The thing is with climate change, we're almost as certain as, as gravity, that, the, that climate change is man-made. In our case, the I mean, people can, can make an impact, but when we go with Bluefield with, uh, with this methane leak detection and, and bring it to the oil and gas companies, they already spent billions of dollars trying to detect those leaks and they want to detect them everywhere that they have infrastructure and every day. And so for them, they sign up very quickly. And once they do that, they're able to reduce it. So you go, there are some people that it doesn't really matter if they believe it or not. But there are some people that are in huge, like the decision uh, making. Either way, it's gonna it's gonna make a huge difference. So I I try to focus on those people where it really matters what they think and what they do. It's the 80 20 20 percent are leading to 80 percent of the emissions. What yeah. are some of the other areas where you see that happening outside of methane, but just in overall greenhouse gases, where you think this could be an effective way to fight this? Hmm. Yeah, the uh, so the large industries. Um, if you're if you're not so super plugged into it as well, that's okay. I th- I think the well, re- renewables are right. Deployment of renewables that's that's a big one. Deployment of renewables is huge. Replacing replacing fossil fuels. How did you get into this business? So before you were manufacturing solar components for third world countries in Africa, and then somehow stumbled into methane. Yeah, well, so that uh, the whole solar energy, it was in Africa, that's very specific, but you go about it for, for like 10 years and you're in the energy sector and some of the projects had involvement from the larger energy companies. And so you get to see all kinds of, uh, or hear different insights and understand a little bit about the dynamics in the energy sector. So I knew there is, you know, there's a need for leak detection and greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, I just didn't know how to achieve it on on such a scale and such a cost. Uh, but I was paying attention to the um, access to space becoming easier and cheaper. And I took a course with a senior NASA advisor, and uh, and he showed us a public paper with a concept of a greenhouse gas sensor that can fit essentially in the palm of your hand. And I just I said, wow. <laughs> so I that's that's when I start. I knew there would be a market, but. Um, 
sure, I, I was not up to speed on the technology and space deployment, and that's why I recruited uh, my co-founder, uh, Richard, and he's the CTO, and also uh, several uh, expert, uh, highly experienced advisors to put this together. Yeah, it's about the, uh, the convergence of exponential technologies. What other technologies do you see coming together to crossroads where we could see huge innovation over the coming years? I would love to... Uh, there's nothing really comes to mind, but uh, I would love to see something in the context of oceans. So uh, there is both a lot of plastic pollution in the ocean and, and a lot of changes, like uh, death of corals and ecosystems. Um, and, and we still, we know, you know, we know about the ocean kind of like what we know about space. So, um, yeah, I'd love to see innovation over there. I think there is um, different, like, underwater drones. I think that's kind of uh, picking up. So that, that'll be exciting. Is that something you could explore with satellite sensing as well? Just looking for different biomarkers, per se? From space, yeah. There is, there's been all different, um, I think, in uh, different wavelengths, you could see some changes from space. I mean, you, you measure it from space, but you see, the, uh, you see the changes on the water. Yeah, we were just at the aquarium yesterday. It turns out 50% of plastic bottles do not get recycled. So there, that's got to be a huge contributing problem to the oceans as well. I'm not super expert on this, so I don't really want to dive into it further. But guys, get a reusable water bottle. So, <laughs> yeah. so Yotam, what, uh, what's one topic that you would like to see addressed on the show? And who would you like to hear speak about it? Oh, I'd like... Um... The, I wouldn't say the arrogance of, of VCs, but the, the way, like the, the way investors approach uh, pitches or startups. So it seems random, but it's not quite random. I think there is a formula, but it's the formula is not, a lot of people say, oh, you've got to talk about the problem. You've got to talk about the market, the pricing, this, that. But these things are just strategies to achieve an emotional reaction from that person. And there is a certain order of emotional feelings from the, from the investor that you got to trigger. So I think, I think kind of talking about that in a more scientific way would be a good topic. So like the strategy to outline a sales letter, that order of an autoresponder, but built to the pitches in your pitch deck, which emotions do you need to pull where? Yeah, in a, in a meeting, I would, I would focus on the meeting itself. Getting, because getting meetings are kind of, uh, it's, yeah, it's not that difficult, but then converting the meeting to an investment offer. I know from all of my entrepreneur friends and from us, it takes so many meetings and it's, uh, maybe we can kind of transform it into science and, and save everybody time. I feel like this would be a very meta thing because if you were to talk to a, a VC about this and they were able to point out what emotions got pulled on in which ways and how that affected them, it wouldn't affect them as much. And they would or they would realize I'm getting affected by this. Most people don't like to assume that that's possible. So it could be a different, difficult conversation to have, but I'll see what I can do. Well, we need someone that is really self-aware because they, they come and they say, oh, I didn't like the market, I didn't like this, but that doesn't make any sense. Like we, once someone told me that um, they will not invest because we have competition, but uh, every startup has a competition and they invested in others. So it was, okay, this was maybe part of it, but there are other things that were missing. Yeah, it's, uh, the biggest problem is a lot of times you don't know yourself. You have that gut or that, uh, that reptilian brain thinking things through. It's, uh, it's our black box in our tummy that we don't quite totally understand. But Maybe it's an entrepreneur that have, uh, there are these entrepreneurs that have done a few rays, uh, a few startups, and they, they might be self-aware or something. Anyway, just keep it in the back of your mind and see if you come across someone. I will see what I can do with that. I certainly have pretty good connections in that industry. So, you know, Tamona, thank you for coming on today. It's been Super awesome having you on. What is one thing I should have asked you about that we haven't discussed yet? The scale, like, because um, in, this, in this conversation, right, we were talking about approaching a problem by using satellites. So what um, people might have in mind say, well, why not deploy IoT, right? Why don't we print, we 3D print some tiny sensors and we spread them all over the world? Uh, isn't that better? Or why don't we fly drones? So the, the thing is that... Um, to compare it, uh, one satellite, the, the monitoring capacity of it in a day is equal to 6 billion sensors. And so deploying 6 billion sensors and deploying one satellite is two different things. And so with a satellite, when you can put a sensor on it and observe the Earth to the resolution that you need for the clients, you, get, um, you basically are 
are making that you're creating a situation where the the incremental cost of you know every second measurement that you're taking is is near zero um so yeah so there is i mean tiny sensors and drones it it could be used in specific areas but satellites are able to bring the the scale that nothing else can yeah it's an optimization problem do you know how many satellite launches we have planned for the next year i would guess 800 800 where are they primarily launching from i would say uh, uh let's say will probably the major hubs are china india us and russia it's a lot out on the east it's interesting it's a it's an incredibly fascinating field it's moving quickly where do you go to daily weekly basis to stay informed stay up to date hmm. uh, i get a newsletter that's called um climate uh morning climate <laughs> that's a really interesting pun oh, weekly right. climate morning climate yeah morning climate and one last incredibly important question for you. What's one challenge that you have for listeners, whether that be a business opportunity or something they can do in their daily lives to make an impact? I think it's uh, if you see something in the news or you hear something and, you're curious and you find it, oh, that, that could be, you know, that could make a difference. Just think, you know, don't, don't get overwhelmed by the fact that it could be a big project or it will take you 10 years to make a difference. Uh, just think to yourself, well, if I wanted to learn just a little bit more about it, what would be my next step? And maybe it's um, reaching out to someone on LinkedIn and asking them about it or maybe reading another article. So just um, uh, if you find, let's say, plastic in the ocean, uh, just, you know, you, you just think about the next step to advance it. That's all. And, and then after you do that, do it again and again. <laughs> just put <laughs> one you, foot in front of the other. Yeah, until like yeah. you change the world. Until you That's change, the, be, the, be the change, right? And thanks for coming on. Where is the best place for people to connect with you? Here's your chance. Tell them a bit more about Bluefield, what you guys are doing, why they should check you out. So we are um, at Bluefield Tech on Twitter. And check us out because we are launching these sensors that have never been out there before and are able to see the world in a way that, uh, that's, that's going to change it for, for better. Uh, we'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And if you live in New York City and don't want to see the island flooded, we may have a chance. But you've got to reach out to Yotem. You've got to help him out. Thanks for coming on today, Yotem. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in, guys. So this has been fun, helpful, informative. Fringe.fm, you know what to do. iTunes and Stitcher, you can subscribe, leave us a review. And until next time, we will talk to you again soon. Cheers. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to Fringe.fm where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.